Hello, I'm Yvette Torres, and welcome to another edition of The Road to Recovery. Today we'll be talking about treatment and recovery in behavioral health for individuals with a disability. Joining us in our panel today are Dr. H. Wesley Clark, Director, Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Rockville, Maryland. John De Miranda, Executive Director, National Association on Alcohol, Drugs, and Disability, Incorporated, and President and Chief Executive Officer, Stepping Stone of San Diego, San Diego, California. Dr. Barbara L. Kornblau, JD, Disabilities Attorney and Professor, School of Health Professions and Studies, University of Michigan, Flint, Flint, Michigan. Ed Hammett, Consumer Advocate, Marbury, Maryland. Dr. Clark, how many people in the United States have a disability? That number is not exactly clear, but we estimate roughly 53 million people have a disability. It may be larger because, again, it turns on your classification schema, but at least 53 million. John, how do we define a disability? Well, a disability is really kind of a legal and an administrative term, and in some quarters you might be considered disabled, but by another uh, jurisdiction you might not be considered disabled. Um, but I use the term often physical, sensory, cognitive, and developmental disability to really clarify what we're talking about. So Barbara, in terms of, of a real sense, so there are individuals who may have had accidents, they're now paraplegic, quadriplegic. In terms of those with a substance use or mental illness, are they covered under the ADA? Yes, they are covered under the ADA. The ADA defines disability as someone who has a substantial limitation in a major life activity, a history of having a substantial limitation, or someone who's regarded as having a substantial limitation in a major life activity. So people with, um, in recovery probably have a history of having had a substantial limitation. They may have one at present, or people may regard them because they're in recovery, there may be that stigma to it that creates that you have a disability feeling. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Clark, let's talk uh, about the uh, um, Americans with Disability Act of 1990. Uh, when it was passed, uh, what type of coverage did it offer for those with a disability? Basically, it represents uh, an effort to prevent discrimination against people with a, a disability. Uh, when you talk about alcohol and drugs, uh, it, you have to approach it differently because there are, are some limitations. For alcohol, and alcohol and, and drugs, illicit drugs are treated differently. Alcohol, if you have a past history of uh, alcohol abuse or dependence uh, re requiring treatment or um, contributing to uh, your disability, you were covered. If uh, people regarded you, as Barbara pointed out, as having a history of alcoholism, you're covered. If you are a current drinker and your job does not have a policy which restricts you from being either under the influence or having um, a DUI or an alcohol-related condition, you can be covered. Uh, alternatively, it, with the illicit drugs, if you are a current user of illicit drugs, you're not covered. If you um, have a history of using illicit drugs but are not a current user, you're covered under the ADA. And if you had a past history uh, and regard it as uh, having a history of uh, illicit drug use you're covered. Mm. Um, Ed, let's talk about a little bit. You're a person with a physical disability, but you also um, are in recovery yourself. You want to tell us a little bit about your story? Yes. Uh, I suffer from uh, alcoholism. Uh, I had alcoholism before my physical disability occurred. It, alcoholism was, uh, was, my disability was due to the alcoholism. Uh, I was in a blackout the night that I, I was mugged. Uh, 
I was left a paraplegic from that that uh, episode, and uh, uh, I've been through rehabs, treatment. Uh, much later, I drank for ten more years after my disability, uh, and found my way into a rehab after after some more trouble with the law, and uh, found an experience. Uh, Fairly devastating, really. It, it was back in a time when when uh, treatment centers weren't weren't really well equipped for for people like me. So, did you become very familiarized with the law in order to be able to access treatment yourself? Not really. Not at the time. No. Uh, my alcoholism had 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 uh, had, had had ventured so deep. I was so deeply in, in, into alcoholism that, that I was just looking for, for any any sort of breath of fresh air. Uh, I, I was I was, I'd reached the bottom, as it said in in in, uh, in the in the alcoholism world, and and uh, I didn't I didn't really question whether the whether I was eligible or not. I just went uh, to the rehab. They they as I said they were ill equipped. To handle me, they built some plywood ramps. It was in an old school, and uh, they, we made do. We made do. Dr. Clark, using Ed's experience, let's go back and cover again. So, individuals with a physical disability, as well as um, alcohol and drug use disorders, as well as mental health, does the act differentiate? I know you spoke a little bit about the differences between legal and illegal drugs, but are there different types of coverage under the act for a physical disability or for a mental uh, illness or for substance use disorders? Well, I, I mean, the act requires a reasonable accommodation to the individual. So Ed talks about uh, uh, approaching substance abuse treatment facilities afterwards, and they made an effort to make a reasonable accommodation. He seemed satisfied with it. Uh, but he also talked about when he lost the use of his limbs, he was still drinking. So that's part of what we're trying to deal with, is making sure that people don't use a disability as an excuse for not addressing both of his issues at the time. So uh, people start focusing on the apparent disability and not deal with the co-occurring issue, which is, is, as Ed pointed out, was his, his continued drinking. So both situations needed to be uh, addressed. And that, in, in a sense, that's one of these sort of reverse discrimination issues. They were dealing with the physical limitation, but not dealing with the, uh, the alcohol or the substance abuse issue. And for this dialogue, it's really important for people to recognize that you can have these co-occurring or co morbid uh, situations and both need to be addressed. And once the facility or once he was ready, I, and, and I can't speak to that process, but once the facility, uh, they made uh, plywood ramps, they were making efforts to reasonably accommodate his situation, and, and, and he obviously uh, uh, appreciated that. Yeah, that's really the unique uh, issue here is that individuals, you know, have both a physical and then an emotional or, or a substance use disorder disability, and, and in order to be able to fully serve them, uh, the service delivery systems, John, uh, have to be prepared, correct? Yes, this is an important aspect of the Americans with Disabilities Act. It really requires that alcohol and drug treatment providers be able to accommodate and for people like Ed to access those services. Unfortunately, the training, the preparation, the programmatic changes that need to take place um, are often not there because this is a very low incidence. We don't see a lot of people presenting for treatment, and it's also an expense issue. So access to care is a major um, problem. Um, this is, it's also important to remember that any agency that receives funding from the federal government under Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 also has an affirmative mandate to serve people with disabilities. And Barbara, who monitors this? Well, there are no ADA police or Section 504 police, so it's really monitored by advocates. So someone like Ed, in Ed's situation, it was very nice that the uh, facility built you know, plywood ramps, but those ramps were probably not 
the ramps that are, are specified to, to, you know, to the code, to, to standards. So um, it would have been up to someone like Ed to turn him in, essentially. And, you know, you're in an awkward position because you finally find a place that's willing to take you. Um, and then how can you turn them in if they're willing to take you? But, um, you know, at some point there has to be a balance where there's education by advocates to say, you know, thank you for making that ramp, but it's a little too steep and it's dangerous for me. I could fall off it. Let me I have some pictures of some ramps that you can do that would be more um, safe for me and, and you know, more inclusive. So it really is an advocate-led thing. So in, in essence, if there is a problem, uh, one goes to a state agency that's supposed to monitor the ADA, and they would send someone out, Dr. Clark, and then they would look at the building. Is this done on a well, state or, or Barbara? Yeah, it, it depends. Um, in some places, the local communities have adopted the ADA's standards into their own building code. In others, you might have to go to either state agency or to the Department of Justice online or whoever's funding, um, whoever is the funding agency, they have an Office of Civil Rights that you can find online um, for their uh, agency for 504 enforcement. So you can go to them and, and file an administrative complaint and say, hey, why don't you take a look at them? Uh, because they're really not functioning the way they're supposed to be. Very good. Dr. Clark, one of the things we didn't touch on, and I, and I want to do that now, is on medication-assisted therapy, are they covered under the ADA as well? Well, an individual on medication-assisted uh, therapy is covered under the ADA. Uh, they are in a therapeutic uh, environment, and so uh, it is illegal to discriminate against that person. Now, that said, there are some regulations uh, that uh, militate against uh, certain medications. Uh, for instance, um, if you, uh, the DOT, are on methadone, then uh, you can't operate a uh, truck or, or bus under the DOT. You can't use the, uh, the DOT uh, approval process. But that has less to do with being on medication-assisted treatment and more to do with their policies about a certain kinds of medications. And even though there are challenges to that, that tends to be the issue. So in short, uh, MAT is covered by the ADA, um, and uh, an individual should not be discriminated against because they're on medication-assisted treatment. Now, if they're at currently using, despite the fact that they're on medication-assisted treatment, then it's a different matter. The ADA w won't protect them. And when we come back, I want to continue to talk a little bit about that and also about some access issues. We'll be right back. It's really important to coordinate care, especially for anybody, but especially for people with disabilities, because they may have some um, physical health issues going on that, that either medications that they're taking because of the disability or, or as a consequence of the disability that may have implications for what kind of treatment that they would get for behavioral health needs. Um, frankly, there's also, I think, um, some pretty good evidence that with a long um, standing disability, especially if you're not getting the services you need to live a fulfilling life, then you're going to have some depression, anxiety, some other kinds of behavioral health issues, and that may lead to substance abuse and other uh, things. So the, the relationship between the disability and, frankly, the community's acceptance of that and the community's willingness to help a person with, uh, with disabilities to live a fulfilling life may have an impact on uh, substance abuse and mental health treatment needs. So it's always important to treat an individual in their whole environment and their whole context. Uh, but particularly when you put together the medications, the life circumstances, and just the ways in which they need special support in order to be able to fulfill their lives. The Americans with Disabilities Act, otherwise known as the ADA, was passed in 1990, has amendments in 2008. It guarantees certain civil rights uh, or gives certain civil right protections to an individual who has a disability as defined by the act. Uh, and it prohibits discrimination similar to other civil rights acts that prohibit discrimination based on sex or age or national origin. It, it says that if you do have a disability that it, you're uh, organization that is controlled by the act uh, must make reasonable accommodations for you. So uh, a person with a disability uh, should be able to 
get gainful employment, live uh, in an appropriate housing, and uh, function in society. Before, addiction and depression kept me from living my life. And now, every step I take in recovery benefits everyone. There are many options that make the road to recovery more accessible. It begins with the first step. Join the Voices for Recovery. For information and treatment referral for you or someone you love, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The goal of, of the work that I do in, in the community today is, is, is to do just that, to, 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 to make what we have available as seamless as possible to the person with a disability. That's all that the person with a disability is looking for. The, they just want the same recovery that we all enjoy, and, and they want to be able to do the same, the same service positions. They want to be able to help others. The biggest part of recovery from, from any disease is being able to give it away and share it with someone else and, and give back. Barbara, you wanted to add a few thoughts on medication-assisted therapies. Yes. Um, Dr. Clark makes a very good point that medication-assisted therapy is covered by the ADA. On the other hand, I think there's a big need out there for education because if you're in a drug-tested environment, you're going to come back with a, a weird drug test, something they're not used to. It's not going to look like a clean drug test. So there may be a need for some education on, to employers to explain to them that this, is, this person's not using drugs. They're taking a medication to assist with their therapy and that this is okay. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I think is important is that um, it's not just illicit drugs, but it, the illegal use of drugs. So if you're using somebody else's prescriptions, that's not legal and that's not protected by the ADA. Mm -hmm. Very good point. Good point. It's uh, prescription misuse. Correct. Okay. John, I want to go to you on the issue of availability. Are there enough services that are made available to individuals with a disability for substance use and mental illnesses? Well, the short answer to your question is no, no, no. Um, in the course of our involvement as the National Association on Alcohol, Drugs, and Disability, we would often go into the field with a checklist, visiting alcohol and drug programs. Do you have a ramp? Many times there's a ramp, but are staff trained? Is there a telecommunication device for the deaf? Uh, what other kinds of accommodations are there? And often found that people were not in compliance. And as a result, people with disabilities, and we've interviewed literally hundreds, uh, often have to jury rig their recovery. A good example was a woman in Berkeley, California that uh, we interviewed. She was a student at UC Berkeley, became a paraplegic as a result of a horse riding accident. When she was ready to start attending 12-step meetings, many, because they were in church basements or on the second floor, were inaccessible. Um, so she actually, as a result, was at that time in her life getting very involved in her own um, kind of movement therapy as a result of her disability. And her movement therapist said, well, you know, let's see if we can bring your recovery into this venue. And that's how she credits her recovery. And in fact, today she's a uh, part of an international able disabled dance troupe that tours uh, internationally. She's still a wheelchair user, 20 years in recovery. Very good. And Barbara, John just spoke of only two aspects, if it, a, a ramp or the hearing impaired. What other provisions? should substance use disorder and mental illness services be looking at? Well, I think now um, we know that there's a, a crisis with the number of children with autism. And as they turn into adults, they are also affected by things like anxiety and depression, and they seek self-medication um, in the form of, of drug use. And there's going to be a need for programs for them. Uh, to, for recovery. And 12-step programs don't always work with them because it's not concrete enough with the way they think. The idea of, of um, asking forgiveness from people, they don't understand 
how other people think and feel. So that's not something that is meaningful to them. So in, you know, in the future, and well now, going forward, um, I shouldn't even say in the future, we need programs to meet those needs. Uh, there are also people with intellectual impairments who um, may not be able to sit in a, in a group like everyone else and discuss feelings and may need things brought down to a lower vocabulary, for example. They still have the same feelings, but it's the ability to express them. So I think we re it's a real comprehensive look. Dr. Clark. I think that's an really important issue when we talk about uh, dealing with various aspects of a disability is you need to focus on the person who presents because there are over 50 official uh, disability categories and the most important thing is individual assessments and being able to accommodate. So someone has a literacy issue or a cognitive issue or a developmental issue we need to be able to accommodate that. Now a specific program may have problems because they don't have a critical mass. So group therapy may not work for mm -hmm. uh, an individual with, say, who suffers from schizophrenia or who, su who um, suffers from uh, a cognitive uh, disability or uh, s something like autism where there's a relationship issue. Uh, but you have to figure those things out. On the other hand, uh, someone with a physical limitation sim may simply need accommodation for the physical mm -hmm. limitation if there's no a corresponding a cognitive issue. So the most important thing is an individual assessment and a willingness to accommodate the, the needs of that individual. And with regard to uh, uh, traumatic brain injury, we expect a large number of individuals coming back from the wars uh, to suffer from either traumatic brain injury or spinal cord injuries, et cetera. We need to be able to accommodate that and recognize that substance use, when you look at the prevalence rate, is associated with uh, a traumatic brain injury and, and, and a spinal cord injury. Um, in the case of our returning veterans, it's a, a matter of recognizing that drinking is, for, if you suffer from traumatic brain injury, drinking is a no-no. The problem is, from the social point of view, drinking is a yes, yes, because that's what they did with their buddies, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the problem with alcohol and TBIs is disinhibiting, uh, and that's a problem, because then you start getting into trouble. So treatment programs need to be able to assess for TBI or assess for cognitive uh, dysfunctions. And we need uh, screening tools that will allow us to do that. Or when you're talking to family members or uh, buddies or partners, you're able to make those assessments uh, because it will help you uh, address the issue. Because many people, especially early in the recovery process, are unwilling to acknowledge that they have cognitive problems. So they may say, I understand, when in fact they don't. But you're saying, if I heard you correctly, that there may be 50, 50 different variations of, of disabilities that I need to be able to assess for. How do I, as a service provider, seek the, the help in order to be able to uh, assess that? And not only that, how do we then create a plan, a treatment plan with the correct methodology and the right components to be able to, to improve a, an individual's life? It cannot be a cookie cutter approach, and I think that's the, uh, another uh, issue. That if I use the same recipe for everybody, I'm not going to produce the, the desired result. So um, it can be a burden on the program, but imagine it's a burden on the person who's presenting for care. So the issue is assessment. I think Dr. Clark is absolutely right. It is the client who's the expert, and you need to ask them about their disability because their particular disability may be slightly different in terms of accommodation than somebody else who has the same category of disability, but the manifestation is very different. Ed. Yes, uh, in reference to some of the self-help groups that I work with in, in Maryland, uh, we have a, a current uh, effort going on just to show that, that you can outreach in, in the smallest and slightest ways. Maybe it's not really the small, considered a small and slight way, but what we've, we've found is that there's a lot of folks who just cannot read. There's millions of Americans who cannot read or read at, at such a low level 
that when when we're speaking in our in our groups and we say, here's this literature, just read this literature and everything will be fine, and they cannot read it. So w our effort is to put audio tapes and video tapes out to to the groups themselves, to to the libraries in our counties, to the corrections facilities and treatment facilities. And uh, it's amazing how fast it took off because I've, I've been in the presence of people who no one, no one wants to admit that they can't read. It's one of, the, one of your deep, dark secrets. Well, thank you. And when we come back, we are going to talk about more about the types of materials that one has to have and tools that we have to have in order to best address the issue of disabilities. We'll be right back. Recovery benefits everyone. I started my own company. I got my dad back. My friends believe in me. Daddy's home. Substance use and mental disorders can be treated. It all starts on day one. Join the Voices for Recovery. For information and treatment referral for you or someone you love, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Awakenings program is a special substance abuse program designed for the deaf and the hard of hearing. I've worked here for 20 years. That's a long, long time. So I've seen Awakenings program grow bigger and bigger and bigger. Before, we only had six beds, men only. So now it's an integrated co-ed program, and it's expanded to 14 beds. We provide 14 beds plus outpatient services to about 20 clients. Then recently we added a new program, it's a DMH program for the Department of Mental Health for the Deaf. People should know that Awakenings program is the largest service provider in the U.S. specifically for the deaf and the hard of hearing. And so here at Awakenings program, all the staff is able to sign an ASL, very fluent, and at all times everybody is comfortable and able to express their feelings and work on their background and develop a better treatment plan to help them meet their goals. Being around deaf culture, being around other deaf helps, yeah. It's more of the ability to communicate quickly, you know, if something's wrong or pops up, and they learn to manage it by getting feedback with other peers here. And they learn to get through problems. I was really surprised that they provided uh, opportunities for the deaf and service the deaf. So really, it impressed me to stay sober. Since I've been here 15 months, I finally realized who I am. Uh, I'm really grateful for this program to have taught me I'm recovering. So I needed a program to teach me how to develop a better behavior and build more hope that it comes to me and I can improve and change. The willingness to grow as a human, that starts mentally, they have to believe in themselves, and as well as taking care of themselves physically. All of that comes together here, and you can usually see it in the client's eyes after three or four months. There's a shine there, I know that sounds like a cliche, but it's there oftentimes after three or four months. It's the ability that I can change. I do believe, you know, that there is hope in recovery and for the rest of my life. And what's really cool is when a family comes for a visit or graduation and they see the person is really different, but they're not sure why, 
you know, and it's more than just sobriety. It's about living. What experience they get from this program can carry on to the life outside. It's the only program that I've learned so much compared to the hearing program. Because they use sign language, and they show body language, and I really recommend those who are out there that really need help to come here. And it's hard at the beginning, but once you go through it, it becomes easier. And I did that, and now it becomes really easy for me, and I'm still learning every day. Recovery is an ongoing process. It's a continuous process through your whole lifespan. So it's important to continue working on recovery. What I do to help people uh, that are still in the program, I support the newcomers and show how I've become sober and explain what I've gone through. I'm always inspired and proud to see when that happens. You know, comparing them to when they first came in, they're you know, ill, they come in thin, and now they're, you know, they leave strong and full of hope and their life is full of color. It works. It really works. But it's not because just the staff or the place. It works because the person comes here and really tries hard, you know, to make it through. And when that happens, that's the best. We talked a little bit about families. Um, Barbara, what is the proper role of a family member when dealing with a disability issue uh, of an individual with a substance use or mental illness? Well, I think it's important for the families to be involved and to help the, provider, the care providers understand the background of the family and the background of the individual, how their, what role their disabilities played in their lives, um, and what kinds of limitations they might have. But at the same time, you know, you reach a point where you have to let the person, the butterfly, go free. So I think families have to have a little balance, have feedback, you know, input, but then let the person go and be part of their own recovery. Okay. Dr. Clark, I want to move now to the Affordable Care Act. Under the Affordable Care Act, there is this whole movement to integrate services. How is that going to work for individuals with disabilities? Well, it actually may work uh, to the advantage of individuals with uh, disabilities because the integrated continuum of care should foster in the essential benefit package comprehensive assessment of that individual's uh, condition. And so uh, not only do you acknowledge the presence of the disability, but you also acknowledge the presence of the mental health or substance use issues, and then have to formulate a treatment strategy to address that. And that becomes very important. Uh, there are, as you know, under the Affordable Care Act components like health homes or high-risk uh, um, uh, situation with people with pre-existing conditions. Uh, so the, the, the effort is to get these uh, conditions addressed and to get people involved in uh, uh, addressing those. There's also a prevention component under the Affordable Care Act uh, to stress assessing uh, for uh, things like substance use as well as diet and weight, et cetera, which then can play a role. But uh, as Barbara was pointing out, what you do need, uh, the practitioners need, uh, is information about the, the individual who presents. So this is another source of information. So family members, family members can give you some history, some experience, whether it's a spouse or a partner or a mother or father or sister or brother, the key issue, particularly with the developmental disabilities, the literacy issues that uh, Ed uh, has pointed out, all of those things can be made available with uh, a careful assessment and bringing in uh, other historians. Getting back, John, to the integrated services issue, um, housing is a big component uh, of that uh, uh, service delivery uh, system. How is the housing, uh, it, let me backtrack, is the housing an important aspect for individuals who, are, who have a substance use disorder or a mental illness as it relates to their disability? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, our service system relies on, uh, at least in California, 
a large system of sober living programs. Once a person is through treatment or is in the early stages of recovery independently, often they're seeking sober living. And the, the accessibility of sober living programs, both from the point of view of the physical accommodations that are necessary, as well as the understanding of the importance of co-occurring and how to, how to help somebody with a mental health issue as well as an alcohol and drug issue, is really kind of lacking. So that the sober living uh, network um, isn't really there for those folks. One of the things we're hoping for is that under the new health care reform, the Affordable Care Act, and some changes that are underway at SAMHSA, there'll be more support for financing sober housing. Uh, and we'll be able to see maybe an improvement of the, that system for these people. We've been, uh, we also want to keep in mind though that uh, SAMHSA, the VA, working with HUD, are pursuing uh, permanent support of housing as an integral part of uh, the treatment strategy. It becomes then the services associated with the housing. Uh, what sober living housing offers is an environment uh, permanent supportive housing, however, may not be as focused initially on recovery, and so we need to facilitate uh, those services in those settings because vouchers are being handed out by HUD and uh, these programs are being facilitated, but we do need to make sure there's sufficient services available to address the psychological and, and the substance-related uh, issues that a person may experience. And how do people gain access to that information in order for them to go and basically, I wouldn't say demand, but really negotiate for those types of services, Barbara? Well, there has to be um, coordination. And one of the things that the Affordable Care Act is gonna offer is also case management. And hopefully, through these case management services, there can be a seamless transition from recovery into the community. Um, and the Fair Housing Act uh, you know, prohibits discrimination against people in recovery from housing because that's considered a disability. So, um, you know, theoretically going forward, there should be this seamless transition with supports through ACA and, you know, the coordination with the um, uh, providers. Mm -hmm. Dr. Clark, are home and community-based services uh, an effective way of serving persons with disabilities? Well, again, you have to take consideration where your uh, client is, where your patient is. As Barbara was saying, in case management becomes an important issue. Yes, there are people who will benefit from home and community-based services, and you have to define what you mean by community-based services. We know that people with identified disabilities may be engaged with a, a number of community-based organizations that are providing services to them, and that should be coordinated so that you don't have uh, either duplication of services or you, you don't wind up uh, neutralizing the effectiveness of services because of alcohol and drugs or, or, or other issues. Under a home health care, of course, a homebound uh, a person uh, or a person who has a, um, say, an accountable care organization or uh, a health home, uh, then that entity needs to be aware of the unique issues that the person has. What we're trying to foster is sort of a recovery-oriented system of care where uh, the individual's unique needs are, are being addressed. You've got a catalog of issues. You've got the person participating in delineating what it is that they need because, in, indeed, uh, at the core of all of this is what does the consumer need and where is the consumer in terms of readiness for what it is that they need. So if the patient is not ready for your version of prime time, it's not going to work. So we want a consensus base. Uh, professionally facilitated uh, process. So community-based services linked with the case management will allow that individual to access the, the best uh, continuum of care possible under the circumstances. I think also um, in the disability community we look at home and community-based services as the alternative to living in a nursing home or an institution. So that's an important buzzword for us. So I think as we see people moving from institutional care, the 35-year-old who lives in a nursing home because he can't afford attendant care, uh, under ACA would be able to move into the community. But then now that he's in the community, he has more of a choice in terms of things like 
substance abuse, because in the nursing home it was a very controlled yeah, environment. Yeah. So there may be some issues. Um, obviously, we want everybody to have the choice to live in the community, but we may need to look at some of those things as people, all of a sudden, it's kind of like the first time you go away to college. <laughs> you know, nobody's looking over your shoulder mm -hmm. and telling you when you have to go to bed and when you have to do everything. So that we need to maybe you know look at that and make sure the supports are there. So it really augurs for a system uh, of support of exactly. those individuals to be able to sustain their long-term recovery. Exactly. Well, and Barbara is also talking about one of the areas where there's kind of a collision between independent living philosophy and substance abuse prevention and treatment. You know, if you're about independent living philosophy, you believe people should have all the opportunities available to them in the community that everybody else has, including the opportunity to drink and maybe develop an alcohol or drug problem. If you're about prevention, you're about limiting those opportunities. And we, our experience has been oftentimes when we go to talk to the disability community about this leadership, we need to kind of thread that needle pretty carefully. And when we come back, I want to continue along these lines and also bring up some other mitigating circumstances, other health problems that individuals with disabilities may have. We'll be right back. For more information on National Recovery Month, to find out how to get involved, or to locate an event near you, visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov. When you have a drug or alcohol problem, your whole world stops making sense. You can get help for yourself or a loved one and make sense of life again. For information, treatment referral, and most importantly, help, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. CAM was originally started back in the 90s to address the alcohol and drug treatment needs and mental health needs of people, specifically with disabilities. CAM stands for the Consumer Advocacy Model, and it was established with the idea of the individual is the expert on what their needs are. So it's a team model. Nothing here is decided based on any one philosophy or any one strict practice. We look at what is a holistic, it's a strength-based approach of using the individual's own strengths and applying them to the clinical model. The benefits of using technology-assisted care for people who have disabilities and or for people who have co-occurring disabilities or SUD disorders are that it provides an arena of access for folks who might not normally be able to get to a treatment facility or might not be able to be served in a traditional setting. ECAM is taking all the services that someone would get in a traditional model, counseling, group counseling, and case management, and putting them in a computer world, a video conference world. And technology-assisted care is taking any of those technology and media that someone might have access, whether it's a text telephone, a video phone or a webcam and using them to enhance their treatment experience. I didn't have a lot of experience with technology until I was involved in this program and it was just fascinating to find out that I could meet with other deaf people on a computer and I felt much more comfortable sharing my story with other deaf people. The primary barriers I see consumers being able to overcome are the stigma attached to drug and alcohol counseling and the access to the treatment itself. We offer a lot of options for consumers to be able to contact us, whether it's our live video conferencing, emailing, a chatting option, telephone calls, texting, every technology out there we're able to use to connect with our consumers. The first time they saw other people on the camera using sign language who were deaf themselves, who were experiencing the same type of problems, that for the first time they really felt connected and they really felt like they had found their home. Well that day, the first time I joined an AA meeting and I saw these people coming on the computer and popping up and I realized there were other deaf people out there. I was really excited. We could all work together. We could share our support and have our discussion. And to have a conversation that I felt comfortable in was great. I would like to encourage other professionals in the field to 
look into the benefits of technology-assisted care, to really have an open mind when it comes to our ability to meet a consumer where they are, to realize that the same clinical services can be delivered just as effectively and efficiently through technology as they can in an office setting. And in this day and age of having to do more with less, everybody is looking for a way to deliver quality services with limited resources. And we learned that by using technology-assisted care, we can expand our service delivery area and meet people where they are whether it's to remain drug and alcohol free or to make other changes in their life, to be able to adapt what we're doing to meet their needs is in the best interest of the consumer. To have a program that was specialized for me helped me succeed. I have a job, I have a better life now. It gives somebody a choice and I believe as an advocate, anytime someone has more choice, that's a good thing. John, you were talking about before during one of the breaks about issues related to HIV AIDS and individuals with disabilities. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about those um, Well, it's elements. an accommodation issue. Um, one of the ways that my program, Stepping Stone, has had to adapt is we have so many clients who are HIV positive or have AIDS that we have to be medication savvy. Um, you know, many treatment programs will have kind of a blanket prohibition on psychoactive drugs or, you know, um, heavy duty medications. We, we decided years ago that we couldn't, we couldn't hold to that. That our clients who either had co-occurring disorders and required psychoactive medication or who were on the various cocktails they needed as a part of their HIV AIDS treatment really needed a, a treatment program that was very savvy about that. So we, do, we began to develop some case management services with funding from the HIV AIDS side as well as co-occurring. Um, and I think as a result, our clients have a much better um, access to recovery because their medications are not being prohibited by the treatment program. Uh, John's point is well taken. It's not just individuals with HIV AIDS. It's people with comorbidities that require medications or unique accommodations, and the programs have to be sensitive to it. And I think the HIV AIDS population is a good example because of the multiple medications, but you may have people who have heart disease, may have seizure disorders, uh, may have uh, liver uh, dysfunction, which is very common in, uh, among some substance users. Uh, people um, may even have an individual who's uh, status post-transplant and is on some fairly heavy uh, medication. So the key issue is, is the program uh, adaptive enough and flexible enough to accommodate the needs of the individual who not only wants to focus on their substance use disorders, but also have other issues. Uh, Such as trauma for women, I mean, in mm -hmm. terms of I mean, that's a, that's a big, big uh, issue. That's for a big issue, depending on the treatment program. You can have a, a, a up to 90% of the women in a specific program. So 70%, 65% of the people seen in substance abuse treatment are men. 35% are women. The problem with that is for women, unless there's a woman-specific program in the community, it's hard to get her needs met, particularly if she's suffering from uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, anxiety disorders associated with uh, the history of trauma and substance use disorder. So there are unique issues, and if you've got medications for the uh, other problems, then you're balancing that. So it's important for treatment programs to be flexible. And Barbara and Ed, I, I want to throw out the whole issue of um, there is prejudice and discrimination related to certainly substance use disorder and mental illnesses, but when you add to that the whole disability component, how can families begin to deal with that? Barbara, I'll start with you. The biggest um, need for people to see in, in people with disabilities is competence because you know we, we have research that says that when people see competence in people with disabilities, they are more accepting of them. And I think that that's a problem and that's something that families can really um, help foster, that, that, you know, the, the side of what this person is able to do, um, their work, their job, their contribution to the family, um, so that people see and get, develop a sense of competence about the person, the individual. Because, and indeed, it is that competence that's going to allow individuals to go out into the work life that to be able to secure independent living, correct? Well, that's true. It's the, and, and I think it, it just takes, it takes a matter of getting over the threshold. You know, uh, a lot of the prejudice and, and, and thoughts of that nature 
are in, inside of ourselves, we being the, the, the person with a disability. Uh, not to say that it doesn't come from the outside, but the fear and all that, that once I uh, step through the fear and, and, and like going to the, re to, to the rehab, you know, that, that was one of the most fearful times in my life because, you know, I was different. I was, I was completely different than all the rest, but once I was accepted, and, and in the world of uh, alcoholism, it, I've found over the years that everyone is acceptable of whoever you are, uh, no matter what you are. Uh, there's one thing that they want, is for you to recover from, from substance abuse that, that you're suffering from. And, and uh, thank God for that, you know. Okay. Uh, uh, once it's a matter of, of making the first steps, get, getting, getting through the door. Dr. Clark, in addition to what Ed has said, uh, the, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration and CSAT through the ATTCs, and are, are there other resources where individuals can avail themselves of some information to help them uh, with some of these issues? Well, we get, we've got uh, information on uh, disabilities and uh, substance use disorder, but there are other groups. Uh, Barbara was talking about uh, Bazelon Center as one, and there's a disability this dread of the Disability Rights Educational Fund, I think, but we'll, we'll provide you with that information. Okay, and what do they do, Barbara? They're um, advocates and they have a lot of information on their websites about people with disabilities and, and what your rights are and what kinds of things you can do. And why is it important for people to really begin to avail themselves of this information? Are there steps that they can take? Well, as I said earlier, there are no ADA police. Nobody's going to come out and tell people, you know, tell recovery centers this is what you have to do. It's really up to the person to become their own self-advocate. And the way you do that is by learning more about disabilities, your rights, and what you're entitled to in the world. One of the best publications that we refer people to all the time is uh, Treatment Improvement Protocol 29 from Dr. Clark's Center for Substance Abuse Treatment. It is really, it goes through the kinds of accommodations that are necessary and it's kind of a primer for alcohol and drug treatment providers who want to serve this population. Excellent. And John, um, let's go back. How do we basically, uh, overall, not, not on the legality of whether someone is, is upholding the ADA, which has its own set of actions that people can take, but overall, what would you tell an individual with both a substance use disorder and perhaps a co-occurring mental illness, and on top of that, have that, that have a disability in terms of helping um, to deal with discrimination and prejudice and stigma? Well, they're going to have to work to get into a treatment program. They're going to have to work at it. And it really helps if they've got a family member who's an advocate, or maybe even a formal advocate through the independent living centers that are interspersed kind of throughout our communities. Um, and they're probably going to have to make sure that the treatment program has the flexibility that Dr. Clark talked about and has at least some basic willingness to work with them. I think if a treatment program may not be trained, may not have all the pieces in place, but if there's a willingness to work with that client and let the client help educate them about what their needs are, there's a good chance they'll get in and get some help and, and hopefully start the recovery process. And Dr. Clark, what do these behavioral health providers need to do? Let's, re you know, recap on that. Well, one of, one of the things I want to stress is that many state authorities uh, take the issue of uh, disabilities very seriously. And they, when they uh, license or regulate programs, they want them to have a plan uh, to put in, uh, into effect for individuals who present with uh, co-occurring conditions, uh, disabilities being a component. So what a program needs to do is to recognize that in 2011, you gotta be prepared to deal with the full range of issues that confront a, a person, and that includes that individual's disabilities if they are present. It also calls for 
specialized training to be able to uh, to to conduct uh, extremely well these assessments. But of course, our ATTCs, uh, state authorities, there are programs that are targeted to help facilitating the information. So again, depending on the community in which you live. For instance, if you're in a community where you're going to have a substantial number of returning veterans, you need to know about post-traumatic stress disorder, you need to know about traumatic brain injury, you need to know about spinal cord injuries, you need to know about family problems associated with those conditions, in addition to uh, the substance use disorder with which that person may present. And you do well to know uh, as much as possible about a full range of psychological conditions in terms of depression, anxiety, beyond PTSD, et cetera. Mm -hmm. John, final thoughts. We have some work to do, but we're well on our way. <laughs> Let's put it that way. There's a lot of people out there. I mean, uh, they say that 17% of the population are people with disabilities. That's a large number. Um, and the incidence of alcohol and drug problems among people with disabilities is higher than the general population. So we have a lot of work to do. We're well on our way, but let's keep going. Ed, final thoughts. Communication and awareness. I find it's amazing to me how many people are just not aware of, of what's going on with disabled folks. They, they just don't have a clue. Very good. Yeah. Barbara? Well, while substance abuse may not be the highest priority among the disability world because the disability community has so many needs, this one, it really has to come into the forefront because it has an impact on every other one. If you have a mm -hmm. substance abuse problem, Absolutely. you're not going to be employed, you're not going to get good health care, you're not going to have uh, a place to live in the community. So I think it needs to move up the scale. Dr. Clark? Well, uh, we've heard uh, my uh, three colleagues comment and their comments are very substantial. We can anticipate uh, having more resources with the Affordable Care Act. What we must do, however, is to make sure programs are trained. Uh, they have staff that are trained. They are prepared. Uh, they have the information systems that will allow them to link up with other resources in the community, whether it's uh, housing, um, employment, child welfare, criminal justice. Uh, we want to make sure that these programs are able to address the unique needs of individuals with disabilities. Mm -hmm. And I want to remind our audience about National Recovery Month celebrated each September. And as we have heard today, it is imperative that we conduct our activities, events, and celebrations uh, in a way to allow individuals with disabilities to also participate. So I want to encourage everyone to get engaged, get involved, conduct events, and make sure that we engage that disability community in September and throughout the year. It's been a great program. Thank you for being here. For a copy of this program or other programs in the Road to Recovery series, call SAMHSA at 1-800-662-HELP or order online at recoverymonth.gov and click Multimedia. Every September, National Recovery Month provides an opportunity for communities like yours to raise awareness of substance use and mental health problems, to highlight the effectiveness of treatment, and that people can and do recover. In order to help you plan events and activities in commemoration of this year's Recovery Month observance, the Free Recovery Month Kit offers ideas, materials, and tools for planning, organizing, and realizing an event or outreach campaign that matches your goals and resources. To obtain your copy of this year's Recovery Month Kit and gain access to other free publications and materials related to recovery issues, visit the Recovery Month website at www.recoverymonth.gov or call 1-800-662-HELP. <laughs>